This is Dr. Gary Medors in his teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians. This is lecture number 29, 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, Paul's response to the questions concerning spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, welcome back as we continue in our lectures in chapters 12 to 14 of 1 Corinthians. We're on page 183 in note pack 14, and we're actually starting to look at the text. Um, there's a lot in this text, uh, and yet at the same time we can abbreviate some. Our uh, time in 1 Corinthians um, is getting pretty expanded, as you can tell. But at the same time, we'll give you enough so that you can get the feel for it, and then you'll have to do your own research. At the end of the day, learning means activity. And if you don't do some activity to learn, such as reading commentaries, thinking through, uh, all you'll do is listen to me and soon forget what I said, uh, even if I said it in a way that was useful for you. So it's important to do your own research in this domain. Page 183, uh, we're talking about uh, chapter 12 now, Spiritual Gifts in the Sovereign Lord. The function of the Spirit is to enable the believer to recognize Jesus as Lord. And that's how the chapter starts. In fact, it's sort of a surprising start. But it's setting some context, and the context comes back at the end of the section in chapter 14. Now about the gifts of the Spirit brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. Be cursed is the word anathema. Some versions will say anathema, Jesus. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there has to be some historical, cultural setting in which this makes sense. We know that we're dealing with a polytheistic culture, a culture that runs its life according to the gods, looks to the gods in various ways, seeks their favor in various ways, uh, even in a pluralistic way. We know that pagans spoke in tongues. Um, we'll, talk, we'll mention some of this later. Uh, so there was that in their life before they came into the church. Maybe that has something to do with why the Corinthian church is the only one who's having some issues here. I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. We don't have that much information as, as to exactly how all this relates but we have enough information to know that the pagan idolatrous situation in Roman Corinth was massive. Now, the section marker and subject signal is now concerning in uh, verse 1. It's not self-evident to what uh, tone pneumaticon uh, those who are spiritual refers. Is it a reference to people who are spiritual, as some hold? Or is it a reference to the gifts, as some others hope? Fee suggests that this terminology is used for gifts in order to place gifts in the perspective of endowments given by the Spirit, um, that is, the things of the Spirit. So when he says, um, I want you to be informed, you know that when you were pagans, uh, therefore, anyway, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have looked over there. All right. Now, let's note, notice the bottom of page 183. It is not self-evident to what this refers, but it's a reference. Is it a reference to people, or is it a reference to the gifts? Consider the force of, I do not desire you to be ignorant, <clears throat> in 12.1, with its counterpart in 14.38. If anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's an interesting passage. But when you think of the boundary markers for chapters 12 to 14, it makes good sense to see that Paul started and Paul ended in a similar fashion. 
The fact that these are the terminal texts makes this juxtaposition of ignorant even more pronounced. Paul's rehearsal of the Corinthians' previous life is, you know, we've been confronted with this oidate, which is the idea of you know, but we were confronted in a negative clause. Don't you know this? Don't you know this? Don't you know this? Instead of putting it in the negative this time, Paul says, you know. He gives them uh, some credit um, in terms of the conversation that they should be able uh, to respond to that. So it's a rhetorical form of reminder. You know, and immediately the audience starts to think, well, what is it that we know? Yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this. So it's, it's part of the rhetoric of an oral culture where these are being read and presented. Paul's reference to idols is not immediately apparent to the 20th century reader. It seems probable, however, that Paul was reminding the readers that inspired utterance were also the phenomena of paganism and that the real test of glossolalia was submission to the lordship of Christ, a submission which would also produce obedience to apostolic teaching. And so this becomes the issue here. Who's Lord? The former gods, Christ, and how does Paul relate to all this as one of the Lord's emissaries? F.F. F. Bruce reminds us, quote, that in the classical literature, Apollo was particularly renowned as the source of ecstatic utterance, as on the lips of Cassandra of Troy, the priestess of Delphi, or the Sibo of Cumae, whose frenzy as she prophesied under the gods' control is vividly described by Virgil. So it was present in the culture that preceded uh, the writing of Paul. At a humbler level, the fortune-telling slave girl of Acts 16, 16, was dominated by some kind of a Pythonic spirit that caused her to speak, and the man who controlled her probably made money interpreting that speech to people. So we see here that we're not going into a situation where tongues was not already known to the culture. It was known to the culture, but now we're under another umbrella. There's an interesting analogy here about how all this comes together. So you were led, Barrett observes, it suggests moments of ecstasy experienced in heathen religion when a human being is, or believed to be, possessed by a supernatural. For example, in Lucian's um, Dialogi Moraturum, Paris, speaking of the power of love, says a sort of God. Now, they, the, the ancient Greeks used the word demon for the word God. They didn't. There's no correlation between New Testament demons and that, but that just happened to be the vocabulary that they used. You'll see that from time to time. Before, um, a sort of God carries us away wherever he wills, and it is impossible to resist him. That's that ecstatic, out-of-control sort of utterance. It was a common phenomenon in the ancient uh, religions of uh, the time of the Roman court. And so these people probably had observed this in pagan temples. They were uh, certainly familiar with the fact that uh, communications with the gods often resulted in the person who communicated with them being in a, in a trance and giving ecstatic utterances of some kind or another. Sometimes the trance wasn't even needed. So Paul's authoritative instruction about true spirituality now comes in verse 3. <coughs> There's about 27 curse tablets that have been found uh, in the archaeological work of Corinth. These curse tablets have inscriptions on them of a variety of kinds where the Roman Corinthians would try to curse someone else, maybe a, a business person or um, someone they're in conflict with, maybe it related to the courts. But we have all kinds of evidence that it was a common thing in Roman Corinth for them to um, try to curse their um, enemies and people they were in conflict with. This polytheistic culture used curse formula 
to influence a variety of things. It could relate to sports, love, politics, rivalries, commerce. Winter argues that the evidence of the uses of curse in Roman Corinth may have been carried into some Christian practice as well. The gods held powerful sway over the populace, and the populace saw their gods as a way to manipulate their world. Well, not too different from some Christians, is it? Asking God to do this or asking God to do that. But this was a negative context we call curse. The question is, Christians, those who had become Christians, had probably practiced this in the past. Did they carry it over into their situation when they became Christians, which would not have been all that far-fetched, given the transition they had to make? Anathema, Jesus, Jesus. <clears throat> Numerous proposals of reconstructing this, but due to some lack of information, there is no final compelling answer to Anathema, Jesus, but there are a number of proposals. First of all, it could be a hypothetical cursing that Paul put in to balance the confession of lordship. Um, nobody can say cursed Jesus. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord to contrast the old life and the new life. Not probably very uh, likely, but some say that. Furthermore, there is an implication here that some non-Christian ecstatics may have been cursing Jesus in their ecstatic state. This was, this was a culture in conflict, at least those who touched the Christian church were in conflict with it. And if they had taken and put curse tablets against other things, who is to say that they might not have used the same procedure to try to get an upper hand in relation to their conflict with the church? Or perhaps even something the Corinthian believers themselves did. That is, call on Jesus to curse others. I mean, they did it with their other gods. Maybe they thought they could do it with Jesus. I mean, the Psalms have imprecatory Psalms where the psalmist cries out to God to take care of his enemies. Well, is it unlikely that it, or even is, is it unlikely that a Christian might not call out to their God to give them relief from their enemies? That's, a, that's not only likely, but a, sometimes appropriate. At the same time, however, it's not appropriate to use the same cultural uh, aspect of the curse tablets. Furthermore, a slogan used as an accusation against Jesus and the Christians could be this anathema Jesus. Was that a slogan that uh, people were using that needed to be addressed? And Paul said, those people are there, but you're on this side. Jesus is your Lord. Therefore, you can say Jesus is Lord. But if you say cursed Jesus or Jesus curse you, then you are not part of the community. In 110 CE, uh, uh, a while after Corinth, the uh, question is, could it have happened during the time of the mid to late 50s? Pliny the Younger gave an order to revile Christ. Well, um, were, was there something going on in terms of reviling Christ in the conflict in Corinth between Christianity and the Jews or Christianity and the pagans? That is extremely likely, but we have no proof to say that that's what this means. Furthermore, Winter's Reconstruction is, quote, Jesus gives or grants anathema, was used by some Christians in their conflicts or divisions due to past worldly practices. That is, they carried it over. Quote, the thesis of this book, that is the book that Winter wrote after Paul left Corinth, has been argue, it has been argued that the inroads of paganism were seen in the way Christians reacted to others in an adversarial situation, whether in their Christian assembly or outside of it. So it's not all that far-fetched to think that the Christians might have actually been not so much saying Jesus anathema, but they might have been syncretistically using curses to deal with some of their infighting, even within the congregation. Jesus is Lord, however, is the, is the watershed about this. It's not a mere verbalization. It's not a formula just to be a formula. It is a confessional truth in formula form. 
Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9, a rather famous verse, uh, if we can uh, fess Jesus as Lord, um, I better read it. I don't know why my memory slips me all of a sudden. Lack of practice, I reckon. Uh, Romans 10, 9. Uh, real quick here. Thin pages. If you, de uh, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus is Lord. Jesus as Lord is a, another one of the translations, but it is a confessional formula. Jesus is Lord. And so to curse Jesus is to deny that. And that's why Paul says you cannot. Anybody who curses Jesus has immediately revealed that their activities are not of the Spirit of God. Because that's outside the parameters of what can be done uh, and certainly what should be done. In conclusion to 12, 1 to 3, many have wondered what 12, 1 to 3 has to do with gifts in chapters 12 to 14. It seems to be an odd introduction to the gifts and therefore often pass over this portion with haste. But 12, 1 to 3 is programmatic for the context. The whole issue of the proper use of special spiritual gifts relates to Christ being your Lord, relates to the Lordship of Christ. If Christ isn't your Lord, you cannot love. Love is the law of a community. Love is the law of spiritual formation, according to Galatians 5. And so this whole, this whole issue uh, has to do with Jesus being Lord. He's the sovereign Lord, as I've said in the outline, and that you have the sovereign Lord and you have the law of love in chapter 13 and 14. The whole issue of these gifts relates to the Lordship of Christ, both in having the gifts, the sovereignty of God, and in exercising the gifts. 13 and 14 make it clear that it's submission to Jesus' Lordship, Jesus' teaching that uh, guides our way. If you compare uh, the terminal statements we should read 14 37 and 38 while we're here it matches almost uh, exactly to what we read in 12 1 to 3 whoops i was over in romans I knew that one right 14 37 and 38 if anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit. Let them acknowledge that what I, Paul, am writing to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone is, ignores this, they themselves will be ignored. The old translations, if anyone is ignorant, let them be ignorant. What's the point? The point is that refusal to accept the apostolic teaching marginalized you from the truth to the category of error. And Jesus is not your Lord in the category of error. Jesus is Lord, and as I've said in another setting, the word, the truth, is Lord because they are inseparable. Now, continue to think about this. In verses 4 to 31, the sovereign Lord has ordained unity and diversity in the domain of spiritual gifts. After the introduction of 12, 1 to 3, Talbert talks about a chiasm, you're expecting that by now, with the remaining section. 12, 4 to 13, spiritual gifts. The answer to that is the repetition of the spiritual gift issue in chapter 14. In the middle, proper motivation is in manifesting the gifts. That is, love is the manager of the community. Not a bad um, uh, idea to see that. Talbert also proposes an ABA pattern for 12, uh, 4 to 30, which is another chiasm I'm not going to list for you. This outline doesn't follow the suggestion. Garland actually presents an entirely different chiastic plan for the entirety of chapters 12 to 14. The, the 12, 1 to 3 and the end of 14 would perhaps uh, make one curious about that, but we're not going to follow that, uh, that lead. We're going to float through it in terms of the paragraphs. 
1b, unity and diversity is observed in the distribution of gifts. So now after he's introduced the fact that he wants to talk about gifts, he begins, rather than criticizing them with the negatives, present the positives and the negatives sort of flow and take care of themselves. There is diversity of spiritual expressions, but unity in the terms of the origin of these expressions. In chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, the nature of 12 to 14 um, uh, students is, is of such a nature that 12 to 14 is like a narrative. Sometimes the, 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 the careful reading of this text yields its meaning faster. There's some key words, there's some key ideas, there's some controversial interpretations, but reading it is important, so I'm going to do that. Verse, verses 4 to 6. There are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There's that theme, the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Same, same, same. Paul treats the issue of diversity within unity, by analogy with the Godhead, the theme of unity and diversity is intrinsic to creation pattern. Unity, diversity. The nature of the Godhead demands unity, while in a variety of ministries and manifestations characterize the persons of the Godhead, it is a diversity grounded in a unity. Note the, the pattern of the repetitions here. I've given the Greek for you who may know it, you, so you can see how starkly you have the attributive form of altos, which means the same. That's the only way we can say the same. Uh, you have um, um, different kinds of varieties, but the same. Alta numa, spirit. Um, difference, but the same Lord. Difference, but the same God. So you've got the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Trinity is portrayed here in terms of the orchestration of gifts and the unity of diver and diversity that is part of being in the body. This same emphasis continues in 7, in, excuse me, in chapter 12 and verses 7 through 11. You'll notice, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, we talked about this before, is given for the common good. Now notice, those, notice these themes. Unity, diversity, common good. It all comes together. And, it, and Paul labors it illustratively in narrative form. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gift of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, little s, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, to and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, unity, and he distributes them to each one, diversity, as he determines. Now this is a special list. It's an interesting list that we're going to look at in a couple of ways. At the human plane, unity is not uniformity, but the ability to live with diversity. Notice that at the page of 185. Take that to heart. Unity is not uniformity. I think a lot of times in Christian leadership, we try to make people conform to what we want. And we think if we get them to conform, we've got unity. No. If you don't have their mind... And therefore, their will, you will not have unity. You'll just have forced labor. Unity is not conformity, but it is the appreciation of diversity. 186, top of the page. The diversity of gifts is delineated, but unity is found in their purpose, the common good, and in their origin, the spirit. The distribution, 12, 7, and 11, provide an inclusio for this section. 
12.7 introduces the Spirit's distribution to each one, individually, see. And 12.11, to each one, closes the section, so it's, a, it's, it's got boundaries. The Spirit's goal is for the benefit, the common good, of the community, the body. The Spirit manages the body to give it balance, to give it the diversity that it needs, to meet all of its needs through the gifts of different individuals. By God's design, no one is omitted. Everybody is involved. From the distribution through the extent, notice the word extent of gifting, is by God's sovereign choice. While everybody is involved in the body, not everybody is equally gifted. Not everybody has the same gifts. Some have a teacup. Some have a barrel. This is life. Why? Because gifts at the end of the day are the end result of, our, of who we are as people. And for, for lots of reasons, people get to the point of becoming Christians and being in the church from a lifetime of development. And some developed well, and some didn't develop well. And that's going to have something to do with the level of giftness when you get into church. God just doesn't automatically override that. Now, there are certain supernatural gifts that are not just functions that the sovereign God uh, must distribute because they are not our choice in that regard. Those uh, stand out, and they stand out particularly in this list that I'll be coming back to to think about. Think of the non-miraculous spiritual gifts as the product of spiritual formation. Say that again. Think of gifts that aren't miraculous. In other words, don't require uh, the intervention of God to achieve, such as healing. Think of gifts as uh, the product of spiritual formation. As we participate in the Christian life and in the community, we emerge over time with strengths and weaknesses, every one of us. And the Spirit manages all of that in ways that we don't even know so that we emerge within the church for its good, if that is our goal at the end of the day, to be used of God for the good of the church. Do you want to know what your giftedness is? Everybody does, don't they? Then get to work. And wait for others to inform you as they observe your patterns and success. Haven't you had people come up to you and say, you know, you're really good at this. Um, people respond to you. You're, you're, you're really a help to me or to someone else in a certain area. Start listening to that. Start thinking about that. And start seeing that as perhaps patterns of your giftedness. The list, 12, 8 to 10, that we just read. The list is a unit. Fee notes with some disdain the variety of agendas which interpreters pursue by placing a certain interpretation upon the content and organization of this particular list. Much of his criticism is well taken. It is disappointing, however, that he does not note the apparent balance and organization of the list, because that is what communicates in literary genre. How is it framed? How is it formed? Those questions need to be answered. Let's think about this. On the issue of tongues being last in the list, this, that's sort of an informational note. I refer you to some bibliography. Is given through the Spirit, is that Greek there? The word how in capitals. How does the Spirit give? Well, we've talked a little bit about this. By energizing who you are, who you have become through your entire life, now under the umbrella of the church. I think that is the standard fare. There are other issues, like the miraculous side of life, um, but in the normal function of the church, most of these lists are dominated by tasks and functions that were needed to make the church operate and to be effective in their world. The individual items in the list. Is the list, and you saw the structure before, look at it, 
on the top of page 187. It's, you can see the structure. When you first look at it, you may say, oh, here's another chiasm. No, it isn't. Because a chiasm requires that each of the each of the uh, pieces reflect the, the above, like this and this have to be the same content. This and this has to be the same content. They're not the same content, but there is a balance to it, and there is a structure to it. And one of the ways we see the structure is that we have a set of four doublets, and we have one odd statement out, which are the miraculous powers, but that becomes the hinge to this. This is, I think, a crafted list. I think it's a balanced list that is sending some messages here. If you accept that, then the miraculous powers in the middle is a major piece of def definition for all the other items in the list. Um, let's, we're going to think about this a little more in a moment. What and how does this list communicate to us? I've talked about the symmetry. I've talked about the balance. I've talked about the center. Um, what's common to this? Well, I think what is common to the, this, this list is that it is something that God has to do, not something that is a result of my individual giftedness. I couldn't heal because I might be gifted in giving aspirins. Um, and, and why would faith even be in the list? We're all required to have faith. But faith is in this list. Why, is it a, why does it seem to be linked to healings? Well, let's think through the list. Possible definitions. The challenge with terms in the list is that lists lack context. You have to, do, and, and consequently, you're forced either to go outside that list and find other usages or look for the logic within the context that you have um, and yet at the same time, we don't always have as much as we want. We haven't had anything in Corinthians, for example, that talks about healing or, or the discerning of spirits for that matter. All right. Now, so it's a challenge in this. Anyone or any source that confidently defines the items in a gift list probably disqualifies themselves from validity. If you read the commentaries on this list, and they describe to you what they think these words mean, you're going to find some variety because we do not have enough data outside of the list themselves to be able to nail all of this. We have some, and it's helpful, and we can learn from broad reading from good sources, and yet at the same time, it certainly isn't finalized. If we accept the possible structure for this list, that I've proposed, that it's balanced, and that that miraculous powers is the hinge, then all the items in the list are part of the miraculous powers. Miraculous powers gives definition to the whole list. And so I'm working on the assumption that each of, that this list is about supernatural uh, ex expressions and about miraculous powers. This isn't something that I could develop by, be, by growing and learning and doing and then coming into the church and do. This is something that God has to miraculously provide. So if we accept that, then all items in the list are part of the supernatural gifts rather than the working out of natural endowments. And this is for ministry in the church. This is due to the hinge of the miraculous powers and the nature of the items in the list. <coughs> and if you read better commentaries on these lists, you'll see some of that in terms of how they define it, even though I have not found anyone that sees it exactly like I see it in terms of the structure. Uh, they hint at it, but they perhaps they just didn't write it out and into a chart. Once you put it in a chart, it hits you like a ton of bricks. For example, the first doublet, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Those obviously have something in common. They both have logos, for example. Uh, I'm not going to go into great extent defining trying to define these words because the literature has plenty of uh, suggestions for you. <clears throat> but I would suggest that if you follow the structure and design of the list, then you're going to say that a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, is not holy hunches, but that it's God's supernatural activity of the dispensing of information. In the first doublet, word or message dominates. In defining these, we must at least emphasize the message 
which proceeds from wisdom and knowledge. It seems persons so gifted would convey God's message to the congregations in a, in a way that's accurate, um, not as final inspiration, but inspired in a softer sense. It's instructive discourse. But where did they get the wisdom? Where did they get the knowledge? One could say, well, they got it from reading Paul carefully, yes. But there's something special about this, I think, beyond just educating themselves. God's hand is in it in a special way. Faith and healing, I think, are a doublet. Well, here's some interesting pieces. First of all, these words are reasonably self-evident. But if they are in this list and they are a doublet, then we have to ask, how do they relate to each other? What's the correlation of faith and healing as a manifestation of the Spirit? And why would faith even be here? We're all supposed to have faith. So it has to be something special. Here, faith is not simply bland belief, but it is special because it's in the list. And it's especially special because of the hinge. Is it faith to perform an extraordinary work or faith on the basis of actually having special knowledge of God's will, which would require direct revelatory knowledge? If the latter is the case, then one has to wonder. And when I first studied this and correlated it with James 5, it hit, it hit me like a ton of bricks. One of the problems in the exegesis of James 5 is that when the elders come together and pray that someone be healed, they don't say if it's God's will. They give no doubt whatsoever in James 5. They pray the person's healed. Every Christian community I've ever been involved in that tries to practice James 5 always conditions that practice. They condition it by if it's the Lord's will and, and in all kinds of ways. And, and I have to wonder, in light of the fact that James 5 never gives you any conditions, it's, it speaks absolutely, those elders had to have a gift in terms of the pursuit of what they were doing at that early stage of the church as described in James 5. And James 5 is talking about healing. James 2 has already talked about faith. And so here we have this collation. And James 5 even uses the phrase, they, if they pray the prayer of what? The prayer of faith. The person shall be healed. Well, correlation is not causation. That's a general principle. So I can't prove my point just by the correlation. But I want to suggest you think about it. Look at it. And at the end of the day, accept it as at least one explanation of how we might make sense out of this list. There's just an awful lot of coincidences here. And as I learned in the military, there are no coincidences. Everything has a reason. So I'm wondering about this here. The prayer of faith which will raise the sick. And so here we have, I wouldn't call it faith healing as some traditions do, but we have the connection of faith and healing. And in my mind, in a miraculous way, and to do it in that way calls for insight beyond just being a good Christian. Then the miraculous powers. Uh, in the middle here. Well, yeah, the miraculous powers. Workings of power, mighty deeds, miraculous signs. This is the hinge. It stands alone. It's not linked with anything else. If the structure proposed is correct, then this signals that all items in the list are under the umbrella of supernatural expressions. And that's what I mentioned to you before. This is not a chiasm, but it is a balanced structure. And easily see the doublets at the beginning and the end, which gives us influence for the internal part.
And then the odd thing out is his miraculous powers. So I'm taking that lead to see the list that way. Then it talks about prophecy and discerning of spirits. <coughs> Throughout biblical history, prophets are those entrusted with revealed truth with the task of conveying authoritative information to God's people. But this has been challenged in the New Testament. Wayne Grudem and some theologians in the third wave, if you don't know what third wave means, look at the dictionary of Pentecostalism uh, that is put out by Zondervan. And uh, Peter Wagner has an article in her on the third wave. And there's the first wave, which is Pentecostal, the second wave, which is charismatic, and the third wave is in the Wimber movement, which was in California, and was the creation of the Vineyard Church, which uh, has grown and is present with us. The third wave redefined, Grudem redefined, the role of New Testament prophets from the classical category of prophet. So the New Testament prophets in Grudem's mind are not equivalent to the Old Testament prophets. Grudem's proposed view has not been adopted by either mainline systematic theology nor by works on biblical theology that I've noticed. I haven't seen anyone in academic publishing who has jumped on his bandwagon. This debate is extensive, but briefly, Grudem recognized the classic definition of Old Testament prophets as inerrant spokesmen for God. In the Old Testament, they were the mouth of God. Moses was the mouth of God. But in the New Testament, Grudem related the work of the classic prophets to the apostles and then created a new definition for New Testament prophets. Quote, the words prophet and prophecy were used of ordinary Christians who spoke not with absolute divine authority. Now, if you heard that and you were thinking Old Testament prophet, you'd say, wait a minute. Old Testament prophets spoke with divine authority. They were the mouth of God. They spoke the word of God, and you better listen. Absolutely. And you know they're not true prophets if what they say doesn't come to pass. Notice the major, massive redefinition that's going on here. But simply to report something that God had laid on their hearts or brought to their minds, that nomenclature and uh, I find tenuous. There are many indications, Grudem says, in the New Testament that this ordinary gift of prophecy had authority less than that of the Bible and even less than that of recognized Bible teaching in the early church. So these New Testament prophets have been downgraded to people who have emotional feelings and thoughts and spew them out to see where they go. Sorry for the sarcasm. Consequently, Grudem created a new kind of prophet who was not ultimately authoritative and could err. This definition allows some church traditions to have prophetic activity since it now does not lay any claim to authoritative revelation and analogy to Scripture. So you can have people popping up, claiming to be prophets, making statements, and see where they go. Because prophets can err. They're just human, you know. And those really are. This, consist, this construct certainly serves certain theological paradigms. Grudem is an odd mix of Calvinism and charismatic in his systematic theology, for example, in his own writings and associations in life. He was, I'm not sure of his current setting, a major advocate for the third wave ideas while John Wimber was alive. Check the Vineyard Church website for literature from that period. He wrote as an advocate of third wave ideas. So there's, there's even more 
to the story of Grudem. Grudem did his dissertation on this question and then published it. He did it uh, at Cambridge. And his mentor was a professor at Westminster Theological S Seminary called Richard Gaffin. When Grudem communicated with Gaffin, whom he respected, what he was writing on, Gaffin was concerned and actually ended up writing a book ahead of Grudem and the publication of his dissertation so that there would be something to offset what Grudem was going to try to say called Perspectives on Pentecost. I think it's in the bibliography. Richard Gaffin, Perspectives on Pentecost is a very important book if you're into this debate uh, about the natural, supernatural aspects. In fact, Grudem, or Gaffin is, should be considered one of the main proponents of um, a cessationist view. Many times when cessationists are mentioned, uh, they're using out-of-date material like B.B. Warfield, who is completely off the charts in terms of what's going on in the modern world. Uh, there's easy targets that are set up and knocked down. So you've got to read widely and read deeply. Uh, to get into this material. I'll talk more about this in my last lecture on 12 to 14. On New Testament prophecy, look at Agabus. That's, a, that's one of my favorite passages when I talk about the will of God. Agabus knew ahead of time God's sovereign will for Paul as he was on his way to Jerusalem. He told Paul what's going to happen. And good sense would have said, well, now that Paul's gotten a revelatory insight into what's going to happen, Paul should do something different so that he can continue to be useful in ministry. But Paul had already set an agenda, had his goals in mind, and he wasn't going to be swayed even by knowing the future. Have you ever thought, if you knew the future, then you could make a good decision? Forget it. Read Agabus. Your knowing of the future is not the criteria for you to make a good decision. You make good decisions for good reasons, not because you know the future. Get that one out of your head. And then Philip's daughters as well. We'll talk a little more about some of this in chapter 14. The discerning of spirits is that next one. Well, a lot of people jump on this and try to say this has to do with figuring out whether somebody's got a demon or not. I don't think so. It's linked, first of all, with prophecy. The discerning of spirits is a common theme in prophetic material, starting in Deuteronomy, to discern whether the prophet is speaking the truth or not. Discerning of spirits is best understood as relating to persons supernaturally gifted to validate prophetic statement, prophetic truth. Discernment of genuine versus counterfeit prophetic statements. The phrase should not be applied to the issue of demonization. Don't think it has anything to do with that. Compare the post-apostolic document called the Didache, one of the earliest documents we have about how the church functioned in the second century. It'll give you some insight into the church's managing of subjectivism in some of these domains. The last doublet, is kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So the first two are clearly uh, the length. The last two are clearly length, which gives logic for the rest. Page 189, this concluding pair as the opening pair of wisdom and knowledge influence seeing this list as a series of doublets joined by the working of miracles. Hinge. Kinds of tongues. Only here and in 1028 do we have the phrase. It goes in two directions. Some say it's ecstatic speech. Some say that it is languages. You've got good scholars on both sides of that fence, and I've only given you a sample of those. There are many. Tongues and acts, most think, are languages for evangelistic and authenticating purposes. But when you come into the book of 1 Corinthians, there's some data that calls into question if it was real languages that a person who knew the language could interpret or translate, or if it is another uh, phenomena of ecstatic speech. 
1 Corinthians 14, 22, however, is real language because that's the illustration that Paul uses uh, in relation to how tongues would relate to auditors who come into a Christian community and uh, don't have a clue what's going on. We'll, we'll talk about that one in its location in a little while. So while 1 Corinthians 12 is not self-evident, and early 14, 1-5 seems like glossolalia, 14.22 raises the possibility of uh, xenologia in keeping with Acts. Uh, the detailed commentaries will unpack this for you. But notice those two words. Glossolalia is from glossa, which is the word for tongue. And then uh, laleo is the word for speech in the noun form. So to speak in tongues, or kinds of tongues. Uh, xenologia is a word that has to do with actual languages. So when you read the literature, you'll see those two terms. Now you should know what they mean. Here's a little bibliography related to that New Testament prophecy issue, which includes the book by Grudem and some others. I notice I don't have the book by Gaffin here. However, you can find that in the bibliography that will come at the either the end of these notes or note pack 15. All right, so we've been talking all this time about unity and diversity in distribution. Now let's talk a little bit about unity and diversity in the functions of these gifts in chapter 12, verses 12 to 31, the end of that chapter. The foundation of unity. Now Paul uses the metaphor of body. Chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form the body, so it is with Christ. So here we have a metaphor being set up. For we were all baptized by one spirit, I would rather say in one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. All right, big metaphor. A famous metaphor, the church is the body of Christ. And Paul works these metaphors in a number of places, not a lot, but some. Let's start to think about these. The metaphor of body is most likely derived from either the Old Testament idea of corporate personality. Now that's, uh, uh, that's technical terms. The Old Testament never bifurcated anything. The Hebrew man... Uh, uh, didn't, like the Greeks, separate body and soul and all that. They were one. There's corporate uh, personality there. Um, there's a number that hold that. Fitzmyers may be one of them. Uh, there's also another option called the Greek or Roman Bali politic, uh, which Fitzmar actually holds best as another author on this material that, that Fitzmar cites. I didn't have the primary source there. Uh, and Thistleton hold the Bali politic which is a natural thing because it's the world in which they lived, to use as a metaphor. What was the body politic of the Greco-Roman setting? It described society of Paul's time. Paul could easily convert either of these motifs for his purposes. The Roman body politic was the unity that they tried to achieve through the population. That's part of that seek the welfare of the city upon which Winter wrote a book and others wrote a book where they were they were part of the same project, um, and they had their body politic, not using all the nomenclature exactly in the same way, but that mindset, that uh, imagery, that paradigm of being um, all united for the same purpose uh, was part of their culture. So we don't know exactly why Paul picked that up, but he's got plenty of ways in which he could have done it. Uh, if not, do it uh, just off the cuff as a good store, as a good illustration. Unity equals the body. Diversity equals the parts of the body. So here we begin the theme of unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. The assertion that in one spirit we were all baptized into one body needs a little clarification. It has a broad history in church traditions. The, some people call it the baptism of the spirit in certain Pentecostal-type denominations. 
and uh, the first and second waves use this nomenclature, be baptized by the Spirit quite a bit uh, in other ways. Let me say a few words. First of all, bottom of 189. This is the only mention of baptism by or in or uh, through the Spirit outside the Gospels and Acts. And in the Gospels of and Acts, it's applied to Christ. He's the baptizer, not the Holy Spirit. Secondly, page 190, the Holy Spirit is not the baptizer, but is the instrument that Christ uses to effect the inauguration of the body. The preposition in is translated by in many translations, but that can be misleading. By is an agency term. The force of the preposition in isn't really clear and it's debated whether it is to be understood as instrumental, which would be a by, or whether it's local, which would be sphere or in or thr through in a softer sense. Using in or through is a better choice than the word by. Uh, Christ is the baptizer. The sp spirit is the one who in... Um, not enhances, but causes this uh, whole situation to function and, and manages the body from that standpoint. Now that's getting a little bit uh, creative in the construct because we don't have uh, the linguistic statements clear enough to say th too much more. The significance of this metaphor, first of all, it provides spiritual unity for the body. It is a metaphor. It breaks down ethnic barriers. The church includes all without distinction. The body imagery eliminates, and the word all eliminates, using this statement to justify elitism or status for some special class of spiritual persons. Those who have arrived or gotten it, as my aunt said to me one time, have you got it? When I visited her and told her I was going into ministry, she was in a certain denomination that you got baptized by the Spirit until that happened, until you got it, uh, then you weren't empowered adequately. So that was her first question to me. Did I meet her theological criteria, even though she didn't think theology? Furthermore, the use of baptize here is a rare figurative use, breaking from the typical water ordinance. Baptism is always wet unless the context indicates otherwise. Romans 6 is wet. It's been messed up by some American Christian traditions, uh, spirit baptism, but it isn't there. It's wet. And that's what you should assume about baptism unless the context indi indicates otherwise. This context does. Furthermore, Roman Corinth would have understood the principle of seek the welfare of the city or body in that body politic idea, if that's what Paul was playing off of, um, which we don't totally know. The when of this phrase, baptism in the Spirit, is best taken as Pentecost and viewed as a forensic statement. The church was inaugurated at Pentecost. That's the baptism in the Spirit and in fire that Jesus talked about. And it is a forensic legal starting of the church. That's what the word forensic means. It's the legal starting of the church. And it's not that every time somebody gets saved, they have a new baptism. No, you become part of that forensic start that the church had. Um, it's a bit of a technicality that needs to be considered. It includes all the who eventually believe rather than inserting a continuous repetition of the baptism every time somebody comes into the church. But we were baptized in the body at Pentecost. And when we believe, we identify with that, we are legally connected to that as a result of our belief. It's a forensic issue. Here's some bibliography on spirit baptism. Um, in fact, Hunter, Harold Hunter, is a proponent of it out of the uh, Church of God, I believe. And so I've given you uh, sources that look at it both uh, pro and con. 
Now the rationale of diversity. We've got unity, we've got diversity. The body gives us the unified, the parts give us the diversity. But let's think about it a little bit in verses 14 to 26. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. I'm wondering where the paragraph starts here. We're actually in the middle of a paragraph. Um, now, if the foot should say, because I am not of the hand, and he goes through this litany of the foot and the other features of it, and of course Christ ends up being the head of the body. God has placed the parts of the body, verse 19, uh, or 18, every one of them just as he wanted them, their sovereignty. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So the diversity. It seems to me that this unit is marked by 12, 14, and 20. Uh, many parts, one body. And 14 says, one body um, made up of many parts. You see the how it's boundaried there a little bit. Even though the paragraphs uh, in most versions start with 15. The emphasis on many draws all members into the circle rather than excluding anyone. Look at the litany of these many paragraphs that I've noted here for you at the bottom of page 190. Every believer is a necessary part of the body. And it, it, we use these illustrations all the time, don't we? I mean, something as simple as tearing off a fingernail can mess you up for weeks. <laughs> That little tiny thing right there. Or break it, break your big toe or your little toe and see what happens to you. I mean, what we think is, is just there and incidental can show up to be huge when something happens. So every part of the body serves a purpose. Every believer needs the help of other believers. Just like every part of the body depends on the good function of another part. Nobody is a kingdom or a body to themselves. Every believer is complemented. Uh, not complemented with an I, but we complete each other uh, by our unity and by being in the community. Uh, it's, it's important that we be complementary with an E, not an I, uh, to each other. We fulfill each other. We help each other. Where I'm weak, you're strong. Where you're weak, I'm strong. And that's how the body is supposed to function. Every believer is involved with others in 25 and 26. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, Paul hasn't laid out right here why he's talking about this unity and diversity of the body. But obviously, he's still dealing with divisions. The divisions that we started to look at in chapters 1 through 4. And those divisions were existing in the exercises of the gifts. And the implication is, through the way he treats tongues, that some thought tongues were the cat's meow. There's a metaphor for you. Some thought that tongues were the cat's meow. And that if they, had, if they spoke in tongues, they were just something special. And Paul denies that and says, no, that's not the case. The rationale of diversity. So, top of page 191, one cannot walk away from this and think that any part of the body is insignificant or that any part can go it on its own. We need each other. Man, that is hard to get our arms around, isn't it? It's, it's such a simple truth, but so hard to live out. At the same time, no two are exactly alike. I suppose the greatest analogy to this is the family. We talk about the church as the family of God, but I have never in my, how many years have I been a Christian? I got, I became a Christian in 1963 while I was in the Navy, the U.S. Navy. 
I was ordained in 1967. So this year, in August, I will have completed 50 years of ordained ministry and 50 years of marriage, for that matter. And uh, I shouldn't get off on rabbit trails here. I'm not trying to remember what I was talking about. <laughs> At, and so um, no, no part in the body is next to me. I had a great thought for you, and I started using analogies, and now I have it has completely slipped my mind what I was going to say. I'm glad this is the first time in all these lectures that I did it exactly that way. I'm not always on my game, but that one, that one really got me. So you can have a good laugh if you please, because I can't hear you. So just laugh out loud. Okay, no two are exactly alike. Let's move on. Page 191, 1D. Diversity is God's plan. Now, grasp this. Unity, diversity. In, in nature, in human life, uh, in forensic uh, policing, no two voices are exactly alike. No two fingerprints are exactly alike. Man, <laughs> diversity. Even I mean, when, you, when you start thinking about nature and you think about humanity, uh, it just shows up all over the place. Everything, everything's different, and yet everything serves a function. Unity and diversity. Diversity is God's plan. If we were all the same, what a boring world it would be. The logic that diversity is part of God's creative plan in 14 to 17. I'm not going to uh, do a lot of reading here. Uh, this is where he goes through his narrative. The issues in the various translations as to whether the series of statements are questions or assertions is noteworthy, but it's really pretty incidental to the meaning. The Greek text maintains question marks. Uh, in a number of these, you can read this. And the versions will vary. Is it an assertion or is it a question? Well, we're in, we're in rhetoric. Questions would make good sense. And yet at the same time, as far as the end meaning is concerned, the meaning is still clear whether it's assertions or questions. So just a little technicality to observe. Verses 18 to 20. The inference is to be drawn. Diversity is God's decision. Verse 18, but in God, in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one as he wanted. The focus of verse 18 is God's sovereign distribution. The, and that sovereign distribution in the way he's created us, it's sovereign distribution in the way that he orders us, it's sovereign distribution in, um, in terms of bringing us under that umbrella and causing us to function. Each clause within that sentence makes a significant point that, that at the end of the day, it's God's work in God's way. Greek students should note that 12, 11, and 18 reflect the synonymous nature of the two words for will, uh, bulimai and tho. Some try to distinguish these synonyms to make major theological points in certain texts. These, uh, their interchangeability, that is there, these two words, interchangeability, here indicates that it is a context, not a linguistic morpheme that provides the meaning. So if you're in a sitting situation where people have used bulimai, for example, to prove something, uh, don't go by bulimai, go by the context. That's almost always true with words. Words take their meaning according to their context, not according to their lexicography. Be very careful, because a lot of word studies are very, well, very, very misinformed. All right. Unity and equality in the midst of diversity is God's plan, in verses 21 to 26. Here again, this is such a narrative format that I'm not uh, going to just um, uh, elaborate on it. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have need of you. It's a beautiful metaphorical picture of what's going on. Verse 24, while our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. There's that concept of division once again. Undercurrent, undercurrent, undercurrent in the book of 1 Corinthians, and in that community was division. 
Questions to ponder. How can one harness harness the unity and diversity of people in a ministry context? How can you make diversity a strength rather than a cause for division and problems? Now, I've pastored, and maybe many of you are pastors or ministry professionals where you deal with people. Or maybe you're just parents who have children. They're, they're all the same, aren't they, the kids? Hardly. They're just as different as night and day sometimes. How, how do you make diversity a strength rather than a weakness? That's a major challenge in ministry. That's one of the um, challenges of our personalities to be able to pull that off. But the fact is, is the first thing we have to do is recognize that diversity is God's will. And if you've got this person and this person, and they're different in night and day, and you gravitate to one over the other, you've got to be very careful here. You need to, to deal and minister to them equally. And so consequently, we have some challenges in terms of each of us being able to live with diversity. We all like people who think like we do. We all like people who act like we do. We like uh, to have the compatibility. But no congregation has compatibility. No family has absolute compatibility. There's diversity. So you've got to find a way to make diversity a strength and not a weakness. It's God's will that you do that. Someone has said that leading people is like herding cats. Okay, if you didn't get that, get this one. Leading people is like herding warm jello in a pan. Now there's a good one. It does not take long in ministry to understand this imagery. Leadership for ministry is not to be modeled after corporations. We have sinned that way in big ways in the modern world. As one author put it, leadership is the way of shared praxis. Praxis is another term for practice. That is, leaders enable followers to own a vision, not just conform to it. There's a very important book along these lines by Thomas Groom called Sharing Faith, A Comprehensive Approach to Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry, The Way of Shared Practice. You'd be well advised to study that book. It's not it's not a simple book. It's not some little useless uh, Christian bookstore pablum. It's a rather challenging book. It's an educational book. If you look at the table of context, contents, you can see how very important it could be in ministry. It walks you through taking a group and taking a leadership idea and working the group through certain segments, about seven of them, so that when you get to the end of it, they don't just know what you said. They understand what you said. And now they're making a choice whether they want to own what you said and get on board. Very, very important volume for those who are in ministry. Groom lays out how to process ideas so that a group, rather than just an individual, owns the ideas. If you're preaching at people, telling them what to do, without bringing them to the place where they want to do it. Sort of that analogy again. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. You've got to learn how to make them thirsty so that they will want to take a drink themselves. It's a drink of the pool of unity and diversity. Power is in group ownership, not just the so-called leader. We're a body, a mere perusal of Groom's Table of Contents, can show you how valuable that book could be for you. Furthermore, verses 27 to 31, the conclusion about being a body will conclude chapter 12 in the next few moments. The concluding assert, assertion of metaphor in 12:27. Take a look at that. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. God has placed in the church, and then he gives another list. Okay, so the body is being focused, and then he follows that up. 
with a variation of the list they gave the first time, without the same kinds of structure, to talk about unity and diversity. The concluding list ranks the communication and leadership gifts first, leaving the showy gifts so prized by some at the very end of the list in 28 to 31. This list has been called an exegetical and lexicographical minefield. One major issue is whether the ranking nomenclature indicates real rank or whether it is just a literary way to do the list. What do we mean by that? Well, look at it. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then you get the rest of the list. Some pretty important things. Miracles, yeah. Gifts of healing. Why did he enumerate? That's the only list that ever happens in. What's going on with this? And there's a lot of ink that has been spilt in terms of trying to come up with a construct that one feels comfortable with in terms of the assertion. While making it clear that apostles, prophets, and teachers are to be preferred to the cherished gift of tongues on the part of some, the list also includes what some might classify as the blandest of all gifts in the list. Helps. You've got people that are gifted all to the point of revelatory material at the beginning and then you've got the janitor under the category of helps. That, that should make the point that everybody in the body is important. Everybody serves a purpose. Own your purpose. Own it with gusto. Own it with integrity. And do it the best that anybody has ever done it before. Whatever that gift might be. In fact, this item helps is so off the radar screen that we have no idea how it was special enough to be called a gift. There are all kinds of proposals. Which may help us understand that the term gift is often merely a description of a function in the body. Every small church pastor knows that a volunteer janitor is a gift from God. This list begins like Ephesians 4 with a focus on gifted people. <coughs> the NIV interpretively translates so as to keep this emphasis throughout. Compare your versions on this one. The ranking by assertion is usually in list, is unusual in list. Does the ranking imply order of importance or order of authority or order of New Testament historical precedence in founding and building the church? There's different ways to see this and still keep apostles, prophets, and teachers uh, unique as people in the, in the list. But there's more one, than one way to think about it. And even more, one way, more than one way to think about apostle. Is this an apostle on the level with the twelve? Paul wasn't one of the twelve, but he was on the level with the twelve. But there were other possibles, perhaps Andronicus and Junius, who were not on the level of Paul, or the level of the twelve, but were still called apostles. Well, that's a big discussion. And here's part of it. Fee wonders if this is not showing subordination to the apostolic group, which would be apostles, prophets, and teachers. Frankly, it is just reality in my mind. They're the leaders. The problem is that it is one thing to recognize who they were in the first century, but hard and controversial to recognize who in our current context. Certainly no one like them, but still there is some pecking order for anybody to function properly. There's got to be leadership in any group. There has to be those who call the shots and those who follow. And it's up to those who call the shots to make followers understand, help them understand, so that they're not following because they have to, but because they want to. That's the difference between effective leadership and corporate leadership. Certainly no one likes them, but still there is some pecking order for anybody to properly function. The first three in this list appear to be office holders, while the remaining are ministry functions. So you see, this list raises a lot of questions. You can trace those questions, but the 
general outline of the list is relatively clear. So we've got Apostle. And that can be studied and studied and studied. Going back to Lightfoot in England, who wrote a major uh, essay on Apostle. Uh, up in, And Thistleton covers it in several sections within his own work. All the major commentaries have excurses on the concept of Apostle as special, like the Twelve and Paul, or as a gift, as a gift, rather than as an office in, in other ways. Apostle was a term that covers the Twelve Apostles, Matthew and the Book of Revelation, the imagery of the Twelve uh, Stones, the Twelve Gates, and so forth. Paul, Adronicus, and Junius, in, Revel in Romans 16, 7, referred to as apostles. The question is if this term should always be viewed as special, as the Twelve and Paul, or if, in a gift list, it could be used as a ministry term, allowing for a broader use of the term as applied to others. Fitzmaier comments that in this text, the apostolic row is to be understood as a form of diakonoi, diakonia, actually, that is, ministry or service. Now, he's Roman Catholic, <laughs> so go there. Most do not most do not accept an apostolic succession proposal, such as the Roman Catholics, or even some Charismatics see apostles at the same level as Paul today. Having seen the risen Lord is one of the requirements of being a, an apostle at Paul's level. Check those texts out. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and the bibliography of a man named Jones. You'll get this in the last handout. Dunn concedes, quote, that apostles represent in Paul a wider circle than the twelve, but believes that they still constitute a special group of founder members who are personally commissioned on the basis of such passages as Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, and so forth. Thistleton quoting Dunn. I don't have Dunn's volume available right here. The exact status of Andronicus and Junius are debated. Most major commentaries restrict 1 Corinthians 12.28 to the Twelve and Paul, and that there are no successors after their time. So this, the issue of apostles as broader than the Twelve and, and Paul needs to be studied, uh, and, but it might need to be studied outside this text and looked at other texts. There's not a lot of statements about anything other than the Twelve and Paul. But there are some, and those need to be accounted for as whether we're talking about an office or we're just talking about a, a gift as emissary. New Testament prophets, like those in the Old Testament, received accurate information directly from God. They probably also served the purpose of accurately proclaiming truth and guiding the church when apostles were not present. Martin describes them as providing revelation of the divine will for the congregation. And I tend to think that New Testament prophets are an office special, very much like the Old Testament prophets, in consort with the apostles, but not a replacement of one for the other in either direction. Teachers are here listed without the descriptor pastors. The teachers were probably non-revelatory persons, gifted in transmission of and explaining the meaning and moral implications of the Christian faith. I'm trying to conclude this. I need to get done here because our time's getting away from us. Teachers are here listed without the descriptor pastors. But the noun helpers comes up in the next point. So you've got apostles, prophets, and teachers. And then you move into others. And I'm not treating all the ones that are in this list. But this one that's called helpers, the NRSV says forms of assistance, which could be anything, only occurs here in the New Testament. It's a term of activity, meaning doing helpful deeds. It doesn't define what they could be, anything. Thayer interprets it as a reference to deacons. The term has a modest use in the Septuagint even. Romans 12, 8 in English sounds similar, but not the same in the Greek. But it is probably not a parallel because money uh, seems in view in that particular context. So you can make connections in English language, but be careful because you've got to get to the underlying Greek word to make a legitimate connection. 
The feminine noun for administration in the NRSV, forms of leadership. In the NIV, forms of guidance. Thistleton, ability to formulate strategies. So you see, everyone's trying to pull out meaning from these because we have no context, nor do we have any other occurrences that can help us. It's only used here in the New Testament. Its extra-biblical usage is in the context of governing. The counterpart, masculine noun, is used for the person who steers a ship. It was clear to them, to a great extent, and, but it, and it probably was not monolithic in the sense of just one thing, but it was a category that could cover a wide variety of things under helps and under administrations, both of which are absolutely essential for the unity and the good running of a body, of a group. Well, the last verses, 29 and 31, a lot more than what I'm going to say are included here. Uh, they're much more significant than I can treat uh, in our time. But the language structure of the questions in 29 and 30, which say, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, all of those questions expect the answer, no, they aren't, no, they aren't, no, they aren't. Greek can set up questions with a, neg a negative and a, and a negative may to make the answer be no, they're not. So it's not guesswork. It's actually grammar. Uses a question as rhetorical, but the author pins the answer down in the process, as well as making it clear that holding great gifts is not necessarily what makes one great. Paul uses an interesting transition statement, but seek the greater gifts, which he eventually shows are the gifts of education. And now I will show you the more excellent way, the most excellent way. This statement transitions the theme of 1 Corinthians 12 into 1 Corinthians 13. How what he says about love is superior is addressed in 13, 13. And now these three remain, but the greatest of these is love. Chapter 13 is an integral part of the movement from 12 to 14. It is not just an afterthought on Paul's mind or an emotional devotional or, or some great chapter on love. It connects 12 and 13. 14, it connects the problem of division, the need for diversity uh, in a community that was less than unified as we move into the function of gifts in 14. 1231 provides a transition to chapter 13. Some translations close with 12, others um, open, uh, close with 31a, open with 31b. Uh, the fact is, class, there were no chapter nor verse divisions in the original uh, manuscripts or any of the manuscripts that we have by and large that are early. This is all created by us later on. And since it's such a close situation, transitional statements always tend to go in both directions. And so consequently, it's, it's pay your money, take your pick, but be aware of the fact that it is a transitional verse and we have a close connection between chapter 12 and chapter 13. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about chapters 13 and 14, and we're going to have to do that in one lecture. Uh, that's not going to be easy, but we're going to achieve it. And then after that, I have a lecture on gifts uh, from the standpoint of the controversy about gifts rather than just the text here. Uh, we've looked at the text. We'll look at the theological domain and how people are arguing about this, and I'll try to give you some guidance and how you can research it and come to conclusions of your own. After chapters 12 to 14, we're in 15 and 16, great material, but not uh, as lengthy in terms of the way I'm going to treat it. Um, and so consequently, we're getting very close to the end. If you've been here for all the lectures, uh, my sympathies to you, my congratulations for hanging in there, and I most hope that it's useful. I think the notes with the lecture can be very useful for you, and I'm uh, appreciative and uh, blessed by the fact that you care to listen. So you have a good day, and we'll be back and finish up chapters 12 to 14 in the next lecture. Blessings on you. This is Dr. Gary Medors in his teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians. This is lecture number 29. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, 
Paul's response to the questions concerning spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 